Shana. Um, next on stage, we have somebody with a cute French English accent, Nicola Franco. Welcome on stage. So, hi everybody. That's how uh, you expect me to, to speak French, uh, to speak English. Well, actually, I, I'm always a bit ashamed when uh, French speakers have this shitty accent, so I, I try not to have it. Um, I'm Nicolas Frankel. For a long time, I was uh, working on the tech side of stuff. I've been a developer, I've been a team lead, I've been an architect. And after 17 years of consulting, I had enough of managers, I had enough of projects, of deadlines, of changing requirements. So now I'm doing DevRel. I assume if you are here, you know a bit about observability. But uh, in the good old days, it was called monitoring. And it was very limited. Basically, you had a bunch of people looking at screen the whole day, looking at dashboards. And if something was not expected, then they would start like typing on their computers. Sounds like a fun job, right? Actually, it paid the bills. Um, I work for um, an organization that um, paid unemployment in France. So you know about France, so we have lots of unemployed and very good social security, so it was a lot of money. And um, on the production side, they were super happy to tell me they had the, the biggest wall screen in all of France. I don't know if it's still the case, but it was really mythical. The problem, it, it doesn't work that well when your system is distributed. And nowadays, I wouldn't say all, but let's say a large majority of our system are distributed. Even if you have a single app and a database, you can see it's the beginning of distributed system. So even if you have a monolith, you can say, hey, I'm doing distributed systems. So for this, we invented another word, observability. I let you read the definition because I've been told that you should never read out your slides and I'm super lazy. I'm a big fan of Wikipedia definition. And basically, observability is based on three pillars. Metrics, logging, and tracing. The session is dedicated to tracing, but I still want to have a couple of words on metrics and logging. Metrics, as I mentioned, we have been doing that for ages. When people were looking at dashboards, they were looking at metrics. I hope, I believe, I'm pretty sure that everybody does metrics nowadays. The only thing that I advise you to do is to get metrics closer to the business concerns. Because the business doesn't care that much about your CPU usage or your memory usage or how much your disk storage is filled. They care a lot about, let's say, the number of orders that have been passed on the platform or the number of orders that couldn't be passed on the platform. So just try to level up your metrics and reuse the whole infrastructure and it will be nice. Logging is, seems to be much harder, at least in my opinion. Um, so here I will ask you a couple of questions, or uh, let's say I will ask questions that uh, you can decide to answer or not. What to log? Logging, if you do automated logging, you will get lots of info, lo low hanging fruits, but very, very low value. Uh, who here is a Java developer or works in, on the GVM or has worked on the GVM? Ah. So about half the room. So I, when I was a young engineer, I thought, oh, I'm a super smart. I will create a Java agent. And the Java agent will, at the start of each method, we log the input parameters. And at the end, we log the return value. Then I can deploy the Java agent to any GVM, and I will get like nice logs. That was a good idea, right? Low, low investments, lot of return over investment. Well. No, the value of what was actually output was not that good. It helped a lot in some cases. It had a lot of problem when you didn't actually want <laughs> to log the input parameters, such as the password. Very bad idea. So 
the only way to do that is to do that manually. And if you have been coding for a long time, you know that code reviews are important because not everybody has the same level in coding. Logging is exactly the same. You need to put as much effort in your code reviews as is in your logging reviews. The worst case is that in general, the people who are using the logs is not the development team unless you work in a DevOps team. So you, you need to take that into account. The logging format is also interesting. When I started to work, you had a problem on a machine, you logged onto the machine, you checked the log files, you read, you try to understand what happened. Nowadays, it's a very rare occurrence that you can log into the machine that produced the log. Because you don't know which machine in your whole like, um, call pipeline is responsible for an outage or for an error. Even worse, the container that created the log might already have gone if you are using containers. So there is a huge chance that you need to somehow send the logs somewhere or scrap them from somewhere. I will get back to it later. And in that case, there is also a high chance that the log shouldn't be human readable. You don't need that. However, you will need to get metadata inside the log or to actually parse the log to have metadata. And so having this additional step in your logging pipeline to have to parse the log is both fragile, time consuming and hence expensive. So why don't you just output JSON directly so you don't need to have this extra step of parsing? Where to log? Again, as a young engineer, I was told you never, never use, you should use system.out.println. You should always log in files through probably a logging framework. And nowadays we use containers. Logging in files is hell. You always log on the console. Time changes. As I mentioned, you need to think whether you want your system, your application to send the log somewhere. So it's an additional responsibility or to have an external third party component to scrap the log on your app, both have pros and cons. I already mentioned the parsing, don't parse it if you can avoid it. Then you need to think that you need to store the log, it might get expensive, especially with some third party provider. And you need to think about the system, will you search log? Because when you have billions of rows, you need a search feature and how to display it. Here are a couple of providers. I'm most familiar with the Elastic stack, but I believe it captures the ecosystem at the moment. So just thought for your thought. Tracing. Tracing is the third pillar. And in this case, I believe the description is not great. The definition is not great. So I came up with my own. And it's probably not original because I read a lot and there are much much smarter people than me. So the idea is you have a set of tools, of techniques, of components, of SDKs, of libraries that allow you to trace a business request across all the components that make up your business request. There were already in the past some tracing pioneers when the systems were not that much distributed. Zipkin and Jaeger are still there. Open tracing has been like, I, I will talk about it a bit later. But the problem of those components is they are proprietary. So if you have a distributed system, if you have multiple components, they all need to be compatible with one single provider. Sometimes they will restrict your choice because you want to have this component, but it's not Zipkin compatible. But not that great. So we need to have standard specification. So remember this XKCD comic, like when you are 14 standards, but then you will create one standard to rule them all. And then you are 15 standards. 
So you, you really need to have a governing body that can enforce the standards or at least that has enough credibility that people will use it. And for this, there is the W3C, which has the trace context specification. The specification is a couple of pages long, so I believe it's not, everybody can read it, it's not hard. And it defines two best concepts. The trace is actually akin to a business request across all your components. And a span happens in one single component. And you have at least one span per component, but you can have internal spans so that one component can, has multi can have sorry, multiple spans. With a little graphic, this is how it goes. I have a single trace. Ah, I lost it. Yes, found it. You have a single trace and you have three components. So all here you have three spans. I have one span per component. And the spans, they are related in a parent-child relationship, but the first span. So here we can see that X has no parent, but Y and Z have the same parent, X. And Y and Z seem to run more or less in parallel. Seems quite easy, right? But after specifications, we need to have implementations. And for that, we have open telemetry. So the Venn diagram of trace context specification and open telemetry, um, those are not too perfect circles because open telemetry adds stuff on top of the specification, and the specification actually only deals about HTTP requests. But still, we can see that we can do something with message. So it's one implementation, and at the moment, I think it's the most important, perhaps the only implementation of uh, the trace context. Um, what is worth noting is I told you about open tracing, so it has been merged into open census to uh, give birth to open telemetry. So open tracing was all about uh, uh, tracing, and then they merged with open census, which I think did logging um, and metrics. Now you've got everything. It's an incubating CNCF project. It has a lot of followers. And I think that at the moment, it's really a, um, a dark hole that it draws every actor in the industry. Lots and lots of providers are open telemetry compatible. They not only provide the specification, they provide tools. And for example, they provide how to send data. So they provide the protocol and the message format to how to send data in open telemetry format. Everything can actually send like open telemetry data. And they also provide an open telemetry collector. The very important thing here is that they provide a collector, but you can also provide your own. Meaning that what happens after this arrow is completely not part of any specification or anything. Hence, you can decide using the right implementer to have the data store that corresponds the better to your use case, whatever it is. Jaeger and Zipkin at the moment have evolved their collector so that you can send open telemetry data to them. So you can keep your existing infrastructure, whatever it is, and just switch your sources and switch Zipkin or Jaeger to open telemetry. And at this point, you can switch Zipkin or Jaeger to any other open telemetry compatible collector. Who here is a developer? Good. So I will talk now how you can actually, in your app, implement your traces. Basically, you have two choices. And the choice depends mostly whether you have a runtime or not. So the GVM is a runtime, Python is, has a runtime, Rust has no runtime. 
if you have a runtime, you can auto-instrument your code. And then magically, the instrumentation will produce the traces. If you don't have a runtime, or if you want more precise manual traces, you can do it by yourself. You can do manual instrumentation. If you want to try traces, if you want to try open telemetry, you should start with auto instrumentation. It's a low hanging fruit, very low investment. The developers, they don't need to care about open telemetry. And then you will get the first result. And with those first results, you can start saying, OK, here I need more detail, or here I have this thing, is it interesting? And then you can ask for budget to have something like more complex, more detailed. I've talked a lot, and I believe in the power of demos. So here, I will show you how it works in those tags, and I will uh, detail. So here, who here is a Java developer? You told me half the room, right? Uh, Python developer? Wow, four people. It's very interesting, depending on the conference that I got half the room or not many. Uh, Rust developers? Okay, not JS. What are the rest? Go? No, no, no. okay. Uh, C sharp? What did I miss? C sharp? Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so here, I want to pretend to have a use case where I'm browsing the home page of an e-commerce application, and so I go through uh, the API gateway. Then the API Gateway forward it to the catalog. Catalog will be implemented in uh, Spring Boot and Kotlin. And then the catalog will ask for pricing for each item, Python Flask, and it will ask for the number of items for each item. So I have an inventory in uh, Axum and Rust. And then, because I have been asked a lot, hey, how does it work with asynchronous messages? Uh, at the last stage, I will publish some uh, dummy statistics to an MQTT uh, sorry, MQTTQ, and I will try to read them through um, a Node.js application. So let's start. Uh, the most important thing is your entry point. In this case, the API gateway. Um, here, I will be using Apache API 6. Who knows about Apache API 6? One person. Good. I'm in the right room. Um, so it's an open source API gateway by the Apache Foundation. It's built on Nginx. Then on top of Nginx, you have OpenResty because the problem of Nginx, it's a very good reverse proxy, but you need to switch it off and on again if you want to change the configuration. At least it's open source version. So OpenResty is a Lua layer that lo allows you to change the configuration dynamically. And on top of that, you have API 6 because OpenResty is very nice, but you need more structure because API, um, OpenResty maps the configuration to Nginx configuration, and we need a bit more maintainability most of the time. So we need to have like abstractions, and we need to have a plugin-based architecture, which those are provided by API 6. OK, so the most important part is the entry point for the reason that first it will generate the uh, trace ID, it will generate the first uh, span ID, and you will need sampling because you don't want that every request creates a trace. If you have 10 millions of requests per day, you are going to have a very large budget to store the traces. In the demo, because it's a demo and I don't want to send 10 millions of requests to get one, I have the sampler always on. But just think about it, normally you should sample. You should sample at the beginning, perhaps when you first implement open telemetry, you have a high sample, perhaps depending on your volume, 1%, 2%. Then you can decrease it again. And when you deploy a new version of any component, you can increase it again, just to be sure. Well, those are ideas. So here, I have my 
project. I will start it first and then I will describe it. I assume everybody is familiar with Docker Compose. Ah, sorry, I'm in Sweden. Um, is everybody familiar with Docker Compose? Yes. Yeah, great. I'm not, I'm not from the US, but uh, let's say I, I, I would like a little feedback sometimes. And it has been a long time since I didn't come to the Nordic country and I forgot that, yeah, it's, um, yeah. You, you know the, the joke about the outgoing Finn, right? No? No? Yes, you do, right? So what is an ad outgoing Finn? Well, they look at your shoes, not at their shoes. It works also probably with Swedish, but since there are many more Swedish people here, and I might be a bit uh, pissed off by this joke that I uh, prefer to use Finns. So I know the, 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 the Finnish guy from Vardin, so they are very, very nice, and they are the one who told me this joke. So I know they won't take it <laughs> badly. Okay, uh, so here I have my Docker Compose. I've been told lately that I should remove version 3. I will probably do it when I'm, uh, I have a bit more time. I'm using Jaeger. Why? I have no clue because I, I've never used them for real. The good thing is that Jaeger has a single image. So I can just have a single image. I don't need to uh, configure multiple components and to have uh, uh, open telemetry enabled is just one environment variable. So very nice. I'm using API 6, of course. Uh, be careful, the latest version, they are only compatible with one platform, so they don't run on Mac by default. You need to set up the platform. I will be using the um, uh, static configuration of API 6 by default. It relies on etcd, which is a key value store, very good for dynamic changes of configuration. Here I don't need it. I will pretend I do GitOps, so I have static configuration, and it's uh, sync with um, a comment. Then I have a catalog. I have the pricing. I have the inventory. I have a Postgres database. So I will be using multiple schemas, each of the component as an independent schema. Let's try it. So I will be here and I will curl. And what I can do already is I will be using some magic of API 6 to also trace additional HTTP headers. So here I will be passing this HTTP header and I will say hello Jeff Focus and I will say localhost 9080 products. Great, it works, amazing. And here, I can already or see in Jaeger that I have the trace, so I have 26 pans, and this is magic. Unfortunately, I cannot make it super bigger, but I hope you see everything. So it starts from the API gateway. If you want more detail, you can always click, and here you can see the additional data that I have sent. So it has traced this HTTP header because it's, I have configured it for this, but it also traced other HTTP headers that are by default, so the, the HTTP agent, for example. We can see that the API gateway forwards it to the product, and inside the product, we can see multiple spans. Now, since half of you have, are um, GVM developers, I can show you the codes. As I mentioned, uh, not this one. As I mentioned in the first version, I have nothing, so it's a Kotlin application. Who here is a Kotlin developer? Oh, come on, three, three people. Who here is using Java 21? Ah, okay. 22, 20, 17, 11, oh, sucks, 8, a very legacy, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I love Kotlin. 
and uh, it won't change a thing if you are using content of Java in this case. Uh, but you can see there is nothing that is open telemetry dependent. Nothing. In my codes, nothing that is open telemetry dependent. So how does the magic works? How, how do I get the traces? Well, that's very easy. As I mentioned, I'm doing auto instrumentation. So when I'm actually building the image, so this is a multi-stage Docker file. The first, I'm using a GDK to compile my codes. And the second, I'm using the GRE to run my codes. I'm taking this additional jar, which is a Java agent, and I run it with the Java agent. That is very fundamental. That again, low-hanging fruit, the, the developers, they don't need to care about open telemetry. If you are responsible of the build system, you can just do that and already have some interesting insight into your application. And I'm not using here any dependency relative to Spring Boot. I'm just using the regular Java agent that works with everything. So Quarkus, Micronaut, whatever, you choose the Java agent and you already have interesting stuff. Here we can see that, sorry, I didn't lie to you. I'm calling the pricing, the pricing here through the API gateway that I didn't specify in my diagram. Also, we see that we get the pricing from the catalog via API 6, but the catalog to inventory directly. It might be on purpose, probably it's not. Either you always go through the API gateway because you are very security minded, or you always call directly because you are performance minded. But it's very strange that on one case we are calling through the API gateway and the other we call directly. So even if you are not an ops person, even if you are an architect, that should be interesting to you. Something also interesting here, we make, we make a, a, a call to the pricing and here we make a call to the inventory. And here we see that the calls are in parallel, which is what I wanted, of course, because I was super happy to use coroutines. Here you can see my coroutines here. So I think, I think I'm using the same dispatcher and I await the return to return everything. I'm not an expert on coroutines. So it's very nice that I have this kind of diagram to allow me to think, oh, that's I, I did correctly. I was talking about don't bother your developers since there are a couple of Python developers here. Likewise, I have, well, I'm not using poetry, I'm sorry. Probably will change it in later versions. So I'm using the requirements.in, I'm compiling them to a requirements.txt. Here again, no dependency on open telemetry. I'm doing just like in Java. When I'm building the image, I'm adding the dependency. And here, that might be interesting to uh, Python developers. There is one la open telemetry library for every regular library. So I would probably need to add it manually, but probably you will miss some of them. So this allows me to install open telemetry libraries. It will sniff the libraries that I already have, and it will install the relevant and necessary open telemetry libraries if they exist. Very nice. I sound like Borat. Very nice. Uh, okay, <clears throat> that's pretty good so far, <clears throat> but we can do better. What we can do now, we, we understand how it works a bit. Uh, now we can do um, manual instrumentation. 
So let's try to do manual instrumentation. I will restart everything. Uh, no, not this. I will restart everything. And I will show you the codes. So on the Java side, yeah, for Rust, uh, I, I need to use manual instrumentation from the beginning. Uh, here, my cargo tunnel. Those are all the libraries. And I need to web them in the code because, again, I have no runtime, so no auto instrumentation. Docker Compose up. So I have changed in this iteration, I have changed. And now, on the Java side, I have added an additional library, which is the annotations. Because I'm using Spring, I can add annotations everywhere. So how is the code change for that? So by default, before, this um, method was, sorry, it's a function. It's a method, it's a method. This method was actually um, instrumented. This one was instrumented. But this one was not instrumented because it was a private function. So now I have instrumented all of them with, with span, and then I can also set the name of the method. Moreover, I can also, just like I did with the um, API 6, I can add additional information. So here, imagine I want to also trace the product ID. I can add a single annotation and I will just say, hey, put this ID here, which means I'm changing the signature of the method just to have this information. As you can see with IntelliJ, it tells me it's not used. So here, what you can do, if you don't want to have this warning, you just say, hey, I use it anyway. But it's still not necessary because you have this information here already. But here, I don't want to do real manual instrumentation. I just want to use the annotations because I'm super lazy. So it's not as flexible as full API, but it's still good enough regarding this use case. So auto instrumentation, annotations. Uh, on Python, it's the same. I have uh, added the like open telemetry. And here I'm using the API. So I'm adding a span manually. And its name will be a SQL request because, well, whatever. I'm also adding an additional attribute. If I do the run again, then you can get back here. I had 26 spans. Now I have 33 spans because I have added manual spans. Looks pretty similar, but we can see that now when I I'm in Python, I have this additional span where it's the same name that I have given it into the code and it, add, it adds the ID one. Likewise, when I call the fetch, I have ID one. So here I can check that actually when I have ID, a product ID one in my Java code, it's actually calling the pricing with ID one of the product. Might be a bug in your program that allows also you to, to check. And uh, the same here, we have the same because it's the same configuration. Uh, something also that you can check here is that uh, my code is pretty stupid because for every item I'm asking the price for with one HTTP request. So if I have 10 items, I will make 10 HTTP requests to pricing, 10 HTTP requests to uh, the catalog, uh, to the um, inventory. Uh, I should do batching here, but it makes for a super nice diagram, right? So I did it on purpose. But in your case, again, even if you are not interested in tracing, in performance, if you are not ops, this is the kind of stuff that you can check. I didn't change the Rust code because it's the same. Now, what I want to do, I want to add some asynchronous message. Because remember, the trace context specification is only you pass a header in the HTTP request, and then 
it's passed downstream. So it's very easy. You could do it manually. But what about asynchronous messages? Because it's not HTTP anymore. Well, we can be smart. Well, try to be at least. Um, and I will add the messaging comp component. And then I will do the passing myself. Not this one, this one. So here I will be fully manual. What I added in my Docker Compose file is the following. I have added this MQTT queue and I've added this analytics image. Analytics is in a Node.js JavaScript file. And what I'm doing in my catalog, every time I receive a call, so here I have a filter. Sorry, I think it's here. No, no. Ah. Here. So I define, so I, I'm not using annotation for the routes, I'm using this uh, Kotlin DSL, and here I will pass a filter. And this analytics filter will do the magic. So every time I receive a request, I will log analytics. How do I log analytics? I get the data and I send it as a message in the queue and I hope that somebody on the other side will read it. And now I'm doing complete manual instrumentation because I cannot rely on HTTP. So on the POM file, here I'm using the OpenTelemetry API. So you see every time I go a bit further from like auto instrumentation to annotations to fully manual. And then now I have the power of the full API. What I need to have to start with is an open telemetry instance. That is actually very easy because the API allows me to have a static method called dot get on the global open telemetry. Once I have the instance, I have access to the full API and I can start to create spans. So here I'm setting the parent. I am myself setting the current context as the parent of this new span. So far, we didn't care about it. It was done for us by the instrumentation, but now I'm doing it. We start the span. Nothing happens so far. What will happen is when we end the span, this is when the framework in an asynchronous way will send the request to the open telemetry collector with all the data. Here I'm setting some attributes, but it's not very important. And here I'm creating the message holder. And here, that is the important part. I will need to somehow send the metadata so that on the other side of the queue, I can know which trace I will be part of and which parent span I will be the child of. And so that depends a lot on your queue. I'm using a version five, and so there is this idea of metadata. So I can send those data as metadata. If you don't have access to version five, but a version three, I think, uh, queue, then it needs to be part of the message itself in the JSON. So here I'm re reconstructing the trace parent from the different bits of data that I have. This is actually how the trace context specification specifies it. Zero, zero, the trace ID, the span ID, and trace flags. So I'm reusing them and I pass them as user properties. And then I send it as a message. On the other side, and did, it, did I start it? I will curl. Okay, on the other side, I have my Node.js application. I hope you don't ask any question because I just learned Node.js for this. Hey, I'm a developer advocate, right? Um, so here 
when I receive a message, if it's on the same topic, I log receive the message, and then manually, I will extract the metadata that I have set in the message. I will reconstruct the context from here, from the user properties, and then just like I did on the other side, I will create a tracer, I will start a span, I will end the span. And this is how it looks. So previous 33 spans, now 35 spans, and you see a new component, analytics. Here, you see the filter that I've shown you. It sends the message, and here, this little, little dot is actually receiving the message. It works. So even if you don't have the library to actually have open telemetry in your stack, be it, I think somebody asked me, can I do that in embedded C? And actually there was nothing. You can do it manually. You just get it from the HTTP header, store it whenever you want, pass it as a message, pass it whatever, and then on the other side you re reconstruct it and you send this HTTP call. On the Node.js side, there is already a library, so I don't do need to do a proper HTTP call, but it works good enough. What we can do as well, just to show you that it's not magical, I can do a Docker. I will stop the analytics. Uh, Docker stop analytics. Analytics. Nope. How is it called? Uh, it's called analytics. Ah, Docker compose. Then stop it. It takes a long time because I didn't implement the correct um, container receiver. I do a curl again. And here, now I get back, I search. I have 34 spans because there is no analytics component. But you, we can see that here, we still uh, are sending the filter. And now we start it again. So as soon as it starts, it will start to listen to the queue. And if we refresh here, now everything has been compressed. You can see the analytics here, and it's here. So even if you have like long afterwards, the span with the same trace and on the right parent um, span ID, it can still reconstruct the whole stuff. And I'm done. Good. Um, I think Twitter is dead, but you can still follow me there. Um, you can follow me on Mastodon. You can follow me on uh, Blue Sky. I think I, that's all I have now. Um, you can check the code. Uh, it's on GitHub. I'm using a bit.ly to check how many people did actually open the link because I'm just curious and I already have bad surprises. Um, and if I got you interested in Apache API 6, you are welcome to have a look so that I'm still paid next year and I can come back talking about another subject. Thank you. And you have... Uh, five minutes. Five minutes for questions. Yeah, when uh, doing the agent stuff... In Sorry again? The <coughs> When you do the uh, on the JVM with the agent, there was uh, magic about uh, the configuration where you uh, posted uh, the traces. Where do you set that up? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand. Could you please repeat the question? I yeah. um, when you did the uh, JVM setup with the agent. Uh, okay, oh yeah. That's the, the good thing is I, I didn't set up anything. I just added the agent when I started it. So here, since I'm using Docker, uh, I'm doing it here. So here, when you start your Java process, you just add, ah, thanks, yep. I think the, the good word for here is fan, something like this. Yeah, correct. 
don't have the right accent, but um, um, so when you, you when, when you start, then you just add the edge of agent. Yeah, but where do you set up where it posts the data? Ah, that's a very good question. So here, those are like in open telemetry, they are like, let's say standard environment variables. So here, this one, I'm telling this, this one is the one where I will use the open telemetry collector, hotel exporter OTLP endpoints. And here I'm using the Jaeger image, which is the one that I like set up here. And by default, I have the port 4317, which is the, I think the unsecured uh, open telemetry port. Cool. And he, no, no, but it's a really good question. And here you can see that I was not interested in metrics and logs. So basically, I set them to none. Security is overrated anyway. It's a hello world application. That's why I'm a developer advocate. I don't care about security. Are there any performance uh, hits worth mentioning? Of course. Do you have? Uh, do you want to have the real answer or the fun answer? Oh, it's here. Both, here. Okay, so a um, little bit of history. I, I come from the dev side of stuff, but I was always interested in ops for whatever reason. And um, at one point, um, I started doing presentation on the Spring Actuator because that was amazing, right? It was directly you had. Uh, a dependency, it costs you nothing, and you have endpoints to monitor your app. And at every talk, somebody mentioned me, yeah, but it doesn't impact performance. And my funny answer was, is it better to go very, very fast and not knowing where you are going to or to be a bit slower? So, well, yeah, um, it's a joke, but it's also true. Yes, there is a performance impact, for sure. Even though um, everything is asynchronous, right? So there will be a performance impact anyway, even though it will be minimal. If you are really interested in the impact, you should measure it in your own infrastructure. I cannot give you, tell you, yeah, 5%, no clue. But as an architect, I value observability, I value maintainability, and performance comes as a second like level concern because in nearly all environments I've worked in that was not the main problem the only place where it was like very important I worked for Nespresso and we have we had a single app to serve the whole world uh, yeah l that started to be a problem because yeah if you are an Nespresso customer you want to have like top-notch service and you don't want to, to wait for too long for your order. Yeah, that one, yes. But all others, pff, just add an, an another, another machine and it will be good enough. Machine is not that expensive, but debugging a problem in your distributed system can cost you like a lot more. So I, I, you had both answers. <laughs> Last question. Uh, yeah, so when you did the instrumentation with the Java agent, yes. how, how, did, how did it know to pass on the trace uh, when you called the price, the, the other service, the downstream service? Okay, so what happened is the agent itself had added uh, spans, okay? And every time it, it sends a span, it sends the trace ID, and its own span ID and uh, parent span ID. So on the GVM port, when after I called the other service, it sent a span. And then on the Python side, it was able to get it from the HTTP header, both the trace context, uh, sorry, the trace context which contained the trace ID and the parent span ID. Then it created its own span, yeah. send the data. And on the Jaeger side, it was able to say, oh, they both belong to the same trace, 
and one is the child of the other. And because there also there is data for timestamps, then it was able to put it in the diagram. Okay, is it clear enough? Um, Not sure. Come, come afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Come just now because we have no more time for question. I will be there for more minutes. If you have questions, I welcome them. And thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.